everyone. My name is Sharon, and um, this is the Sunday morning at the Marxist Library virtual edition. Um, we are, please mute yourself if you're going to be talking. Our program is two hours long. The presenter usually speaks for about an hour, and then we have a really robust discussion. The views expressed are people's individual views and not the views of the Marxist library. Um, we uphold, but in general, and we have a lot of different, as, you, as everyone will note, we have a lot of different views here, but we generally uphold Marxism and especially Marx's idea that it's not enough to understand the world, the point is to change it. Um, after the presentation, we'll have a short break where we will let you know about upcoming programs and also about our need to raise funds. So even though we're virtual, we still have expenses and um, we'll get to that after the main um, presentation. So it, it is my pleasure to introduce Phyllis Bennis, who has been a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies for many years, where she heads the New Internationalism Project. And Phyllis has been a role model for many people who have been working on peace and solidarity because she upholds the best of the tradition of understanding the world in order to change it. And they're, they're, the whole project does a very good job of research and analysis, as well as being part of the activist movement to make change in US foreign policy. Um, Phyllis is the author of 11 books and um, you can, see some, some of them listed in the introduction, in, in the flyer that we put out. And um, she continues her activism and wants to talk about where the peace and solidarity movement is right now, how we got here, and what can we look toward in the future for strengthening and building that movement. So Phyllis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I just have to write one thing. Thank you, Sharon. And thanks to the Marxist Library for inviting me. I love being back in the, in the Bay Area, even though I'm not there and it's freezing cold and raining here. Um, but I do appreciate being keeping up connections to the Bay Area from all my years there. You all know that since World War II, we've we've been able to look at the world from the vantage point of the US being the center of imperial interventions, not the only country that was intervening around the world, particularly in the global south, but certainly the, the biggest, most consistent and most dramatic and most horrific uh, interventions and wars came from the United States. And throughout that period, in most of those wars, there were large US movements uh, sometimes connected to global movements, other times more limited to the U.S. Uh, I would say from, say, the, the exception, of course, was during the Korean War, where there, the, there was a, a peace movement, but it was small. Um, I think that, yeah, I think it, it didn't take on the same characteristics as later anti-war movements did. Um, by the 60s and then through probably the late 1980s, the two big movements were around Vietnam and around Central America. I'm glancing around at who's here. I think most of us remember the Vietnam era wars and we're also involved in the Central America era uh, anti-intervention movement, uh, which interestingly, Chomsky among others has written some very prescient works on uh, the nature of the movement in, around Central America, which was something I had never really thought about in the years that it was, it was very lively in the years that I was involved with it with so many other people. In the sense, what, what he identified was that although the protests of the Vietnam era were far bigger, you had the giant uh, mobilization protest, you had giant uh, days of action where there would be 
250,000 people in San Francisco and 500,000 in Washington uh, that you didn't have around Central America. But those, those protests were actually quite limited in terms of demographics. It was young people, it was college age people, and the draft, of course, played the major mobilizing role during that period. The Central America movement was grounded far more in the churches. So you saw community-based mobilization. The sanctuary movement that grew up in the context of the Central America movement was very much grounded in local schools, local churches, uh, and reached far more broadly across the country in rural areas, in small towns, in big cities, uh, far more than, than was true around Vietnam, which is, I, you know, I'm not exactly sure what to make of it, but I think that it is a, an important thing for us to just be aware of. By the 1990s, I would say, in general, the anti-war forces that had been in many ways the most visible and largest kind of mobilizing component of the broad progressive movement was shifting. Uh, and the anti-corporate globalization movement really emerged as a, a, uh, a powerful uh, and very visible movement. The black movement at that point was still, had, had suffered so much in the 60s through the COINTELPRO uh, program of the FBI. Uh, it was thriving in communities, but it didn't have the same level of national, um, uh, national attention, if you will as some of these other movements that were predominantly white, not only, but predominantly. So the anti-corporate movement, the anti-globalization movement comes to a, a tipping point in 1999 with this, the battle in Seattle, uh, what was known as the battle of the, the, the turtles and the teamsters, uh, taking on the corporations and the WTO, and really move forward as part of what was then emerging as a really strong and visibly global movement. The plan was the next big protest was going to be in October of 2001, when I can't remember if it was the IMF uh, World Bank meetings or the WTO meetings, one or the other was planned for Washington DC. Now there were during that period, there, there was some major anti-war mobilization. I would say particularly we should look at the, the 1991 mobilization against the first Gulf War, the first US war against Iraq, uh, where, which was in my view, grounded very much in the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the, the first Bush administration looking for a way to show the world that we are still the sole superpower, even if our sparring partner has collapsed. And you know, how do you do that? You take the world to war. Um, the movement at that time <clears throat> was big and uh, uh, cantankerous and had two big coalitions after the initial split, not surprisingly. Um, but both of those trajectories continued. There were very large protests. Uh, but then after the war, which was very short, if you remember, it was only about six weeks that the actual militarization of the of shock and awe uh, was, was uh, in place in Iraq. Then you had a decade of crippling sanctions that were devastating with huge numbers of people dying. You all probably remember the famous statement from Madeleine Albright, when she was asked on 60 Minutes uh, about the 500,000 children that had died as a result of US sanctions. And without missing a beat, she didn't deny that it was US sanctions. She didn't deny the numbers. She immediately said, it was a hard choice, but we think the choice was worth it. And later said that was the worst thing in her career. She wishes she had never said it, but she never said either that she was apologizing or that she thinks she was wrong. She was sorry she had said it out loud. I, of course, was very sorry she, sent it, uh, she said it a week after my book on US domination of the UN uh, uh, went to press. I would have used it, you know, anyway. The broader anti-war movement during that time largely disappeared. People were working on other issues. There was a movement targeting the sanctions but it never had, it was very much faith-based. It wasn't only faith-based, but that was where the, the, the energy for it came. Uh, and it, um, it, it never took on a mass protest uh, um, context. Fast forward to the 9-11 attacks, 
of 2001. Immediately, the first thing that happens in terms of movements is that the IMF meeting is canceled. So the big protest is canceled and flights are canceled all over the world. <clears throat> so all these people that had planned to come to Washington for what would have been giant protests, that's off, that's off the agenda. And in certain ways, the, the broad protest component of the, the um, anti-corporate movement never really recovered from that. I mean, they, they had plenty of protests over the years, but it never really got back to where the trajectory had been leading right after um, Seattle. So you then have the immediate mobilization, literally within days of the 9-11 attacks before the US went to war, which was only about three weeks later, but you already have the beginnings, the glimmerings of an anti-war movement emerging across the US. And the, in fact, the first protest was held on October 7th, the day the US actually began bombing Afghanistan. That movement emerged at a very difficult time. At that time, something like 88% of the people in the country supported going to war against Afghanistan. There was a, a line out there that said essentially, the US Bush had no choice that there was a demand to go to war, that he had no choice, he would have had to do it anyway. I don't believe that, I don't think that's accurate. I think that there was a incredible paralysis that hit immediately. No one alive at that time had ever been in the United States when it was attacked. Pearl Harbor was attacked in, you know, when Hawaii was not a state, it was a US base, but it wasn't a state, it wasn't part of the United States. There was nobody who had actually experienced that and people were paralyzed. My own sense is that there would have been broad popular support for any president taking virtually any decision. And while there was certainly a danger of actual fascism at that point, um, there was also an opportunity, there could have been something else. I, in, in a book that I did about foreign policy after 9-11, um, I wrote the speech that Bush should have given that night ordering down his plane after he finished reading about my pet goat to the kids, he should have given an actual speech where he talked about what this says, what this attack says about where we were wrong, about international law and international cooperation and all those things. And I think there would have been widespread, not universal, of course, but widespread support for that kind of a, uh, uh, an elite response. That was not uh, the choice. Obviously, the, these people had been the neoconservative elements within the ruling class have been looking for a, an excuse, a way to move towards a more aggressive uh, war posture. And this gave them a perfect opportunity. They grabbed it and, and took it as, as we know. So mobilization at a global level at that point immediately turns to the war. And immediately the parts of this broader anti-corporate movement that emerged particularly in Europe and parts of Asia, not as much in Africa and, Latin, well, Latin America too, not as much in, in Africa and other parts of Asia, but was a, a very powerful movement immediately pivoted to turn its focus to anti-war uh, organizing. In fact, the announcement for the creation of, of a protest movement, uh, a protest day on February 15th, 2003, was actually first announced at the uh, European Social Forum in Florence that November, it was, it was just a few weeks uh, of, of time in between. Um, so internationally, you saw these giant mobilizations coming together, biggest in the places where the governments were supporting the Bush-Blair drive towards war. So in London, in Madrid, you saw the, the much bigger demonstrations than you did, for example, in, in Germany or France, where there were giant demonstrations too, but they, those governments were opposed to the war, so you didn't have quite the same urgency. Uh, and those protests, which ultimately happened in somewhere close to 800 cities on that day, that single day, really put pressure on governments all around the world, demanding that they not endorse, they not participate, they not send troops to join this emerging coalition of the killing, as we called it. Um, but it was, it was a very... From the beginning, that one was by far the most global of the anti-war mobilizations we had ever had, partly because it was the first time that the internet was really a viable instrument uh, that was widespread, that was widely accessible, 
in not all the world, obviously, but in much of the world. So communication was possible in a whole new way. There was also, some of you will remember the New York Times the day after wrote this piece uh, where, um, what was his name? Tyler something, something Tyler, uh, wrote, there is once again, two superpowers in the world, the United States and global public opinion. And this notion of the protesters as the second superpower really kind of took hold. I actually think there was a, a more nuanced understanding of that, which was that one of the things that was so extraordinary was not only these amazing movements that erupted in, as I say, somewhere close to 800 cities that day, but the fact that there were also governments all around the world for, the, for, their, own, for their own reasons, not, not because they agreed with the, the positions of anti-war mobilizations, but for their own reasons were prepared to stand up to US pressure. And you saw that particularly in the UN Security Council where there were, uh, the, the permanent members were divided, of course, the US and the Brits on the one hand and France, uh, um, uh, France, China and, and uh, Russia against the war. Then there were the 10 elected members Two, it was it, Syria actually was on the, on the council at the time and somebody else I'm forgetting that were against the wars. But there was this group that became known as the uncommitted six, who were countries, none of whom would have had the power economically or politically to stand up to US pressure on their own, but collectively and backed up by the fact that there were these protesters flooding their capitals. This was Mexico, Chile, Angola, Pakistan, Cameroon, and Guinea. So none of them very powerful countries, but all of them stood defiant of this demand to endorse the war. And they forced the UN into this position of being against the war for eight months. So for the first like four months leading up to the war and then the first four months of the war. That was unprecedented. That was really an extraordinary moment. And it wasn't, I mean, we should be very clear that when the, the US did go to the Security Council uh, it was three days after, well, two days, I guess, after the, the attacks of 9-11 and asked the council to endorse a resolution the US had drafted. At that moment, that council would have voted unanimously to endorse anything the US brought them, partly because the diplomats themselves were still in shock. They all lived in New York. They had kids in school near the, the, the Trade Center. It was, you know, it was as horrific for them as everybody else. But the US had very deliberately not put into that resolution a reference to chapter seven of the UN charter, which is what is required if you're going to get UN approval to use military force. The charter is vague and weird on all kinds of things, but it's very clear about, well, a couple of things, but it's very clear about what do you have to do to make an armed aggression legal? One, if it's an immediate act of self-defense and two, if the security council endorses it. Neither of those two things happened here. So this war was clearly illegal. There was no claim, uh, no legitimate claim of self-defense. If they had, for example, brought down, if the US had scrambled jets to bring down one of the planes, that would have been a legal, if horrific, act of self-defense. Um, but they didn't do that. And they didn't, in my view, not because they were worried they wouldn't get support, but precisely because they did not want to acknowledge the legitimacy of the United Nations in that role, despite that being required under international law. So what you had was a superpower, if you will, led by social movements all around the world, but backed up by a set of governments, some governments, and the United Nations. So that was, it made it far more powerful than it would have been made up of movements alone. At that point, from that point on, for the next eight years or so, seven or eight years, the anti-war mobilization really dominated progressive politics, progressive mobilizations across the US uh, and, and in many ways globally. The biggest of the anti-war coalitions, United for Peace and Justice at its height had almost 1500 member organizations of which if I remember right, about two thirds were organizations that had something to do with anti-war stuff, maybe less. And the rest were trade unions, they were women's groups, they were all kinds of organizations who wanted to be part of that mobilization, wanted to be part of that, uh, of that movement. 
So it was extraordinarily broad. It was not as deep as one might have hoped, but it was powerful because of how broad it was. It was cross class, it was, it was cross everything. It was cross racial, excuse me. And it demonstrated enormous power in a kind of popular front uh, uh, way. That lasted until about the time around 2007, 2008, 2009. At which point that movement, that organization, but that movement in particular uh, went into crisis. It didn't collapse entirely, but it was significantly weakened. I would say that just one thing about the, the period when it was very strong, throughout that period, there were again, two sets of, of coalitions. Uh, there was United for Peace and Justice and there was the Answer Coalition. And the difference was largely on how to deal with or what to say about, because nobody was doing anything about it, but what to say about Saddam Hussein. So the answer position was Saddam Hussein, whatever we might think of him as irrelevant, he's fighting against US imperialism and therefore he's an ally. The UFPJ position was, we are against US intervention, regardless of who's in power, Saddam Hussein is a, a thug and a dictator and we have no intention of supporting him. There was no condemnation of him officially particularly, it was just that there was no support. That was the biggest difference. There, there were differences that emerged tactically at other points, but that was really what divided the two, um, the two coalitions. By the period around 2007, 2008, as I say, the movement largely collapsed. From early that period and certainly later, the, the line emerged that this was because the anti-war movement was too tied to the Democratic Party and they were all in bed with Obama and Obama said he was gonna end the wars and so the peace movement gave up. That was neither true nor, well, it was not true, let's put it that way. Um, there's a germ of, of truth in it, but it's nowhere near the reason for the collapse. There were at least five reasons, I would say, that the, the peace movement um, was so weakened and, and came close to collapse at that time. One was the financial crisis. Another was the massive transformation of the nature of the war in Iraq that began around 2007, 2008. And I'll get into each of these separately. Uh, another was that for the left components of the uh, of the, of the anti-war movement, there were still no counterparts of the kind that many in the left were looking for. And that was a major problem. The movement itself, United for Peace and Justice in particular, made in my view, wrong choices about how to move forward at that changed moment. Um, and then there was the Obama phenomenon, which I think did not have much impact on the leadership of the movement, but did certainly affect both funding and uh, broader mass participation from people who, were, who did not identify particularly as activists, did not identify as leftists, did not identify as anti-war anything, but who were willing to sign petitions, come out in the streets uh, to oppose this war because it was so horrific. So let me take, take each of those and, and go through a little bit of why I think they were all, um, uh, they, they were all so key here. First of all, the financial crisis. So for one thing that turned the attention of people, elites, the media in the United States and around the world away from this notion that the war in Iraq was really the centerpiece of US imperial anything to this now US centered but global financial crisis that was leaving people's lives destroyed. In the movement itself, a lot of activists were suddenly faced with having to respond to new crises, economic crises, financial crises, within their own families, within their own communities. And I think it's important for us to be considering that while internationalism, in my view, should never be viewed as a privilege uh, for, for some, that it's not necessary for movements overall, it is necessary for movements overall. But at any given moment, the, the choice for people of what to work on, what to make a priority for their political work, given that most people don't do their political work full time, most people have to deal with holding down a job or looking for jobs, 
maybe multiple jobs, dealing with taking care of kids, dealing with families, dealing with all those things that affect ordinary people's lives, particularly working class and poor people in this country, suddenly did not have the choice to make an international issue, a foreign policy issue, a war and peace issue, the main thing they were working on because suddenly their community was faced with crisis. Maybe it was something like the water crisis in Flint that came somewhat later, but this was, this was the kind of crises that, that we saw, the, the aftermath of, of Hurricane Katrina, all of these things that then took off with the economic crisis and suddenly became so much worse, so much more dangerous, so much more damaging, uh, made it impossible for a lot of people who had chosen to work on anti-war stuff, they had to make another choice. And so you had a shift in the, the international and domestic focus of the world, of the media, of governments, of all kinds of forces, as well as the movements, both in the US and globally, shifting from war to the economic crisis. So that's number one. Number two, the nature of the war changed. So in the first years of the war, you had huge deployments of US troops. You had 150,000 US and, and allied troops in Iraq. Uh, you know, you, casualties were incredibly high. They, the, the deaths were very low relative, say, to Vietnam because of improvements in, in military medicine. Uh, huge numbers of people who would have been dead uh, from their injuries were coming back and surviving with you know, single, double, and triple amputations and uh, horrific, uh, uh, horrific medical crises, but able to survive. Um, but the overall casualties began to drop. Why was that? Because the shift began around 2007, 2008, different generals were kind of vying for, do for dominance between what was then a debate between the strategy of counterinsurgency and the strategy of counterterrorism. Now, both, of course, lead to massive uh, death and destruction in the country where it's being fought, but they're quite different than, well, they're different from each other, but, and they're both different from what happens with a large, massive ground troop mobilization and deployment uh, in terms of the numbers of, of casualties among the invading and occupying troops. So you have this debate going on between General McChrystal, who was supporting a counterinsurgency uh, um, strategy and later replaced by General Petraeus, who wrote the book literally on uh, counterterrorism. But both of them were rejecting the kind of large scale uh, uh, ground troop deployments by the period around 2008 and into two, 2007, eight into 2009 in the first year of the, uh, of the Obama uh, uh, administration. So one of the things that happens, you have less US casualties, less US blood. That means there's far less coverage in the media because as we all know, Afghan or Iraqi or Palestinian or other, other casualties do not create the need for massive uh, propaganda for massive um, uh, support in the media, coverage in the media, but U.S. casualties do. When U.S. casualties drop, so does the media coverage. That makes it very hard to get the attention of people who are already focused on this huge crisis they're facing in their day-to-day -day lives. And then, of course, the focus by that time, when we're looking at the Petraeus shift in particular, who talked about anti-terrorism all the time, the focus is on getting the terrorists. So that sounds better somehow than going after Iraqis in some much broader sense. And then of course the movement in Afghanistan is still going on. There was never the level of opposition to that war that there was very early to the war in, uh, in Iraq, even though the war against, uh, sorry, the movement against war in Afghanistan began right at the beginning. It never grasped the popular imagination, the popular, uh, political view, and even within the progressive movement, which may have supported an anti-war position around Afghanistan, it didn't necessarily rise to the, to the level of willingness to mobilize around it the way the Iraq war did, partly because that was still viewed in the context of 
at least relative to Iraq, that's a good war. If it's not good, it's at least better. This was something about vengeance and vengeance is very much rooted in the US, in what US exceptionalism is all about. There's a big chunk of vengeance in there. So people like that idea. Then there was all the stuff about how terrible the Taliban were and particularly the question of women's rights being under attack. And that was used very powerfully uh, to, to broaden support for the war in Afghanistan. So all of that continues while the once huge and vibrant and central movement against the war in Iraq is starting to flounder. It's starting to, to fade. So then the question of, so what did this mean for parts of the left? Parts of the left had been looking for a long time to find their counterparts in opposing this war, because there was still this view that we could make this into the kind of war, anti-war movement that we had around Vietnam or Central America, where the left component of that broad movement within that broad popular front, the left was saying, not only do we want US troops out, US intervention to end, but we support the other side. In Vietnam, it was that component of the, of the anti-war movement who said, we support Ho Chi Minh, we support the NLF. You know, the, that, was, that was the core. There was never a goal of transforming the entire movement into that. But the fact that that existed at the center of that much broader get the troops out kind of movement really strengthened it. During the 1980s in the Central America Wars, it was a very similar thing. We not only want US intervention to end, we support the FMLN. We support the FSLN in, in Nicaragua. And I think for a lot of people, there was an effort that went on for a long time to create something like that. And the problem was in these wars, there wasn't something like that. These were not left-led national liberation movements. The armed forces that were fighting against US intervention were frankly not the kind of forces that I at least, and I think most people on the left wanted to support. Um, the fact that they were opposing the US was for the same reasons they had opposed the Soviet Union, if we're talking about Afghanistan. It was straight up nationalism and there was a reactionary core to it, social reactionary for sure. So there was this very um, difficult challenge, sort of how do we deal with that? How do we, what do we do about that? when? In some cases, these, these movements existed but had been suppressed. In others, they had never risen up in that same way. In, in Iraq, the Communist Party had split and the bigger half was supporting the US intervention. Um, so that was very hard. Now, there were exceptions, of course. The US labor against the war developed ongoing, really powerful ties with the oil workers union. Uh, organizations like Madre, found the counterparts among the, the uh, organization for, uh, for women in Iraq and, and other women's organizations. There were these kinds of organizations. In the later years, civil society groups in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan uh, began to mobilize and, and groups like 9-11 uh, families developed ties. Uh, Terry Rockefeller has been one of the champions of, of our movement, I think, in maintaining those ties over years. But, in the broadest sense, progressive forces, left forces specifically in the United States didn't find our counterparts in these wars and that made it more difficult looking for old forms of solidarity that no longer uh, existed. So that was, that was a problem. Now this becomes more significant later, particularly around Syria, which I'll get to in a minute, but in the context of, the, uh, of Iraq as well in the post Arab Spring, the, the second deployment of troops that began in uh, 2014 under Obama. Um, so in all of these ways, that question of counterparts uh, was, was a problem. And then there was the question of strategic decisions that the movement itself made or didn't make. Around the time of the economic crisis and the Obama election, UFPJ went into what I recall being about a year and a half or maybe a couple of years of internal debate about strategy. There were some working papers distributed, there, was, there were debates, and essentially it came down to two approaches. One said that uh, our goal, our strategy in this period should be to rebuild an independent peace movement 
that engages with younger people, that has more people of color, and that is stronger, and that once again can be the, a, a centerpiece of, of opposition to US imperialism and of mobilization for the, the movement writ large. The other, the other position said that our strategy should be to redirect away from focusing on building the independent anti-war organizations and mobilizations and focus on getting anti-war and anti-militarism materials and strategies and focus areas into the hands, into the very center of the other movements that were already on the rise in this period. So the immigrant rights movement, the environmental justice movement, some of the black freedom movements, all were rising uh, at a time, the women's movement, all were rising at a time that the peace movement was sliding back. And some of us believed, it's no surprise to you which side I was on in this debate, um, thought that that was actually a more useful, more strategic approach. UFPJ made the other decision to, to go forward with trying to rebuild a strong independent anti-war movement, bringing in younger people, people of color, uh, and it didn't, it didn't survive. Uh, funding dried up almost immediately after the, the economic crisis had hit, and the Obama stuff, I think, had an impact on the funding. Uh, the office had to be closed, the staff was gone, and it turned into basically what it is today, which is a network of lots of organizations and good folks around the country who are you know, working hard to kind of uh, pass information out, that sort of thing. But it is no longer a viable center of anti-war organizing. And then finally, the question of uh, the Obama election. I certainly wouldn't say that there was no uh, impact. There was. I think what's important is that I don't think it impacted the leadership of the movement, uh, which was in general more sophisticated, more grounded in the left and not in the broadest sense of things. Um, but certainly some supporters of the peace movement, funders and others, uh, did buy into this notion of Obama as a peace president. I think the leadership of the peace movement understood that Obama had been very clear. Although some people had not heard it because they didn't want to hear it, he had said from the beginning of his campaign, I am against dumb wars, the dumb war like Iraq. He made very clear that he would improve on the war in Afghanistan, which of course he did. He came into office, said, we are going to have a major debate in this country over what way forward for the war in Afghanistan, but first we're gonna send 17,000 new troops and then we'll have that debate. So they sent 17,000 more troops, had a debate that lasted about eight or nine months. And at the end of the debate decided that a surge was the way to go and they sent 30,000 more troops. So in his first year, Obama sent 47,000 more US troops to Afghanistan. I think some people may have been surprised by that. I think the leadership of the anti-war movement was not. But there's no doubt that in the context of the broad popular front component of the anti-war movement, the election of Obama did play a role. So all of those things I think were important. After that time, there, there have been moments when the rebuilding of the identifiable, self, both self-defined and publicly defined anti-war movement really took on uh, important, uh, important moments. At the time of the Arab Spring, the solidarity movement that emerged in tandem in a certain way with the Occupy movement that was going on in the US uh, was emerging in a very powerful way. It was hugely challenged by, in my view, a lack of really understanding what the dynamics were, particularly in Egypt, some of the other countries as well, but as most especially in Egypt, where the impact of Tahrir Square and the, the Arab Spring was so dramatic with the ouster of Mubarak that just looked like this is what building social movements is all about. I remember the day it happened. I was speaking in, in Boston that night and People were waiting. There, we had a phone line open to Cairo to, to get the word when, when he stepped down and he didn't and people were devastated. And it turned out that by the next morning, he did step down. And it was this extraordinary moment of, of victory and jubilation. And I think too few of us understood fully the role of the military in making that happen. The military was making a decision that their ability to stay in power which they were in power through the Mubarak dictatorship was at stake if they completely lost public support. And the way to do that would be to back up this massive social movement calling for the overthrow of Mubarak. Uh, 
And you all know what happened at that point. The first free and fair elections ever held in, in Egypt a year and a half later in 2013, elected Mohamed Morsi linked to the Muslim Brotherhood. He's not really prepared for that kind of leadership, doesn't do it well. There's all kinds of issues of lack of democracy and, and other kinds of problems and a lot of antagonism to any role by the Muslim Brotherhood from a lot of different forces, including some of the secular forces that had been very involved in the Arab Spring early on. And at what, at what at, excuse me, at one point, the protests begin again, protesting against Morsi and the military kicks him out, arrests him, he dies in prison, the military takes over. And what we have now is a far worse military dictatorship than existed under, uh, under Mubarak. But I think in that period, there was a, a sense of connection, but without the kind of background information that would have been critical to that. Uh, similar issues arose with, with Libya in, in uh, 2011, when there was massive opposition, but it sprang up and disappeared. And, and there were such divisions among Libyans, particularly Libyans in the diaspora, many of whom were supporting US intervention, uh, that it became very, very difficult to mobilize a real, a real movement at that point. Then when you have the emergence of ISIS, especially ISIS of course had, had emerged first in, in 2004, but they were one among many uh, uh, militant operatives in operating in, in Iraq. They, they weren't particular in any way. It was after uh, their emergence in 2014, when they emerged uh, in 2013, I guess it was first, when they emerged taking control of territory in both Iraq and Syria, that suddenly ISIS emerged making the so-called global war on terror, which is what Bush had called this war from the very beginning, it transforms it into a war against ISIS. And the war against ISIS gives it a new or renewed kind of legitimacy because who could imagine anything other than wanting to kill ISIS given how brutal they were. The brutality of ISIS in my view was not exaggerated. It was as bad as those horrific videos uh, showed us. It was also a relatively small number of people who were being killed in those horrific ways. Larger number of people who were forced to live under their rule were suffering, suffering enormously, but nowhere near the numbers who suffered under US occupations, other wars that had gone on, uh, the numbers of people killed were, were, not, were not close, but it was real as, a, uh, as real terrorism in, in terms of terrorizing entire uh, populations. This raised an even broader problem for anti-war forces in the United States when uh, Syria emerged as a major venue for this new war. And the debate emerged, there were all the issues around red lines and chemical weapons and should the US be bombing and should the US send troops and all of this. And it's another, in a sense, it's another whole story. And it's important because in this case, unlike the earlier divides over the Gulf War in 1991 and the Iraq War that began in 2003, where the movement had been divided, but both sides of the movement agreed that the goal was to get the US out. The difference was, what did we think about who was there? But both sides agree on what should happen. In the case of Syria, that was not the case. There was actual disagreement between two parts of the movement, those who were who felt compelled to take a position on which side they wanted to win on who should win the war. So there were some people who said that Assad and his supporters should win the war. They sometimes talked about it in, in the context of, of sovereignty. I think there's real debates about what sovereignty means in this globalized era, but nonetheless, that was sometimes the argument. Sometimes it was explicit about Assad. The others claimed that they wanted the opposition to win pointing to the people who in my view were quite heroic in the first six months of the Syrian uprising who were calling for human rights, calling for a massive transformation of the government, all of those things. But of course, by the time the armed insurrection took place and what became the Syrian civil war, which then became what is now 11 separate internal, regional and global wars, those people were all or almost all either 
killed in prison, in exile, or in other ways, unable to really function, certainly in any leadership role. And the leadership, particularly at the armed level, were mostly Islamist ex extremists that were being armed and supported by the US and its allies and a host of other regional forces from Turkey to Saudi Arabia, et cetera. So my view, which I, I took a lot of grief for, as you can imagine in that period, was to say that our role at that point should be to look at what could we do that would help end the war, to stop the killing, not supporting either side, not calling on either side to win or lose, but to call for ending the war, not winning the war. What happened in the movement in this country, it happened in a few places in Europe, but it was particularly bad here, was that the people who took up positions on either side were so dogmatic and so sectarian in their views that it became an incredibly toxic environment, mainly online, but not entirely. So it was mainly on Twitter and Facebook and whatever, but it was also in meetings, in seminars, people stopped wanting to engage with it because if you said anything, you were either an Assadist or you were an imperialist stooge. You were one or the other. And it was, it was a pretty terrible time. And the result was we weren't able to build, in my view, a viable movement. At the moments when the US was about to bomb, there were brief moments and we rose up and we were able to stop along with the Brits who actually did it better, but we, we got their, their bounce back, if you will. We were able to stop the Obama administration from bombing Syria in 2013. It was rather an extraordinary victory. It's documented in that great film, We Are Many. But by 2014, the bombing started. So it was a very um, short-lived uh, success, if you will. And then finally, and I, I wanna stop soon so we have time for, for discussion. I would say that today I'm feeling much more optimistic. I'm optimistic partly because there, the legacy peace movements are still out there, are still trying, are still trying to build in ways that bring in younger people and people of color. Um, I'm not sure any of our legacy movements are going to be in leadership in a few years. But what I'm excited about is that there are some new organizations that are rising that are identifying specifically within the anti-war, anti-militarism movement, uh, groups like the dissenters out of Chicago, the uh, Justice is Global, which is focusing a lot on the intersection between the US, China, the threat of a cold war between the US and China and anti-Arab, sorry, anti-Asian racism in the United States. They're led by young people of color and they've got great ideas, creativity, and they're reaching a lot of other young people. The other reason that I'm feeling optimistic is that we're seeing a lot of success emerging in the, in the trajectory I had hoped for back in 2007 and eight, where other movements that don't define themselves as primarily anti-war and anti-imperialist and anti-militarist organizations are taking up the links. So some of it I think is, is really centered in the movement for black lives. You remember when their policy uh, uh, platform emerged, what about a, two years ago, I guess now, there was a section on Palestine that of course created a huge stir, but it was part of a broader section that was dealing with the issue of militarism, military spending, the, the military budget and the militarization of our communities and how those things are linked. That was hugely important and they're still playing a leading role in making that linkage between militarism and militarization and what the military budget says about all that when 53 cents of every federal discretionary dollar is still spent on the military. In the environmental justice movement, we're seeing some of that. A couple of my colleagues at IPS from the National Priorities Project have recently produced this fabulous new pamphlet that's called No Warming, No War, um, that's aimed at climate activists. And they're getting a great response to it in a bunch of different organizations in the climate justice world um, that are looking at both the environmental impact of wars, military bases, particularly overseas bases, et cetera, and looking at military spending as what needs to be cut so that we have money for the Green New Deal. So that's, all, that's been very important. So you see that some in the Sierra Club that worked closely with Jane Fonda in creating the um, fire, drill, fire Drill Fridays movement last year that brought a bunch of new people 
sort of into the streets for weekly protests at Congress and weekly teach-ins the night before that linked climate with a bunch of different issues, with migration, with women's rights, with a whole bunch of things, including one on militarism. And that connection is, is being made. In the Poor People's Campaign, we're seeing this very strongly in their, the, the Poor People's Campaign led by uh, Reverend Liz Theo Harris and Reverend William Barber, uh, based their work on Martin Luther King's evil triplets of, of racism, poverty, and militarism, plus climate. And those four intersected evils are the way they, they mobilize around the country. Reverend Barber's speech that, that was focused specifically on the question of militarism from about two years ago now, it was May of 2018, uh, that talked about the history of militarism in the US and its links with, with racism. He referenced Howard Zinn and what Howard taught us all about the origins of the United States in genocide and, and slavery and the origins of the United States from the beginning, <clears throat> including movements against genocide and slavery and war. So in all those ways, I'm feeling very optimistic. And I will leave you with just one piece of good news, which was the, the mobilization around Yemen for the last two years that had an extraordinary set of victories with both houses of Congress voting to, uh, to end all US direct involvement in the Yemen war and to stop uh, in the last one to stop uh, at least some of the military sales to Saudi Arabia and the UAE. This really emerged out of a very new configuration of forces. There hadn't been an, a solidarity movement with Yemen, particularly. And there's a host of reasons why, which I will get into. But all of a sudden, about two years ago, you saw this new movement rising that brought together some of the legacy peace groups and some of the humanitarian aid organizations that have been doing work in, in Yemen, partly focused on, on what the United Nations had been saying, that Yemen for several years now has been the worst humanitarian crisis in the whole world. And that mobilized a lot of people. Then the, the murder of Khashoggi, of course, mobilized a lot of antagonism to Saudi Arabia, despite the long years of close collaboration. And in my view, I would say that a little bit of anti-Arab racism in there uh, played a part as well. I think if it had been Israel that was um, uh, participating directly in, in the, the Saudi war on Yemen, we wouldn't have seen the exact same uh, configuration of forces. But it worked and they had great support in, in, uh, um, in Congress from Ro, led by Ro Khanna, but with Barbara Lee, with the others from the Progressive Caucus right from the beginning. So this is maybe the beginning of something new and different, that it was a very different kind of configuration of forces, not so much focusing on building street action. There, was, there were a few mobilizations in a few places, but they were small and they were never the main, the main part of it. It was other kinds of mobilization that really played a key role. And I'm optimistic because of all of that. So for all of my focus on how things collapsed and how terrible things might be, I'm actually, at the end of the day, quite optimistic. And I'll stop there. Uh, yes, Sharon? You're muted, Sharon. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Phyllis, very much. That was great. And I'm sure we're going to have a lot of people wanting to get on the stack. Uh, but before we do that, I'm going to call on Jean to talk about our upcoming programs. Jean? Uh, you need to unmute yourself, Jean. To, uh, yeah, this is good. Yeah, we hear you. Not now. <laughs> I think you re muted yourself somehow, Gene. No, I didn't. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. Unable to start video. Oh, you want to start video? Okay, then we'll have to uh, just one minute. There you go. Yeah, there you go, yeah. yeah. Okay. We so, can hear you, Gene. 
You can hear me, okay. Yes. yes. All right, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Phyllis. This is not only excellent, and it's one of, the, one of the programs I know I'm gonna have to come back and look at again, because this, again, there's a period that we all live through, and it's good to see that analyzed so carefully the way you did, and we really appreciate that. But um, as you know, the, 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 the wars are only one aspect of the things we have to deal with as Marxists. And so let me, um, uh, next week, um, uh, our comrade Raj, uh, of, uh, who focuses primarily on the Institute, as we all do, will be talking about capitalism and ecological crisis and socialism. And Raj, uh, since you're here, do you want to say anything about that? Uh, it's on our website. People can look at it. Um, but again, uh, this is one of the key crisis points that we have. Um, so th that's coming up next week. You can read more about it um, on our web page. We'll get some flyers out on that. Uh, and we also put it on the Indebate calendar. Um, after that, we have collective action, collective worker action in the tech industry. And I think Alan has set, has set that up. And... Uh, that should be very interesting because that's a crucial part of the uh, of the economy. And then we'll move to uh, John Holmes talking about the history of the U.S. working class. But then on March 28th, we're open. So uh, we're open to people organizing uh, uh, some talks on that. And I'll pass it on. So that's what's coming up. Um, and we don't charge for any of this, but we do appreciate um, financial contributions. And is uh, Richard with us? Yeah, I am. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gene. Um, yeah, just a, a quick fund appeal. We still need funds. Um, I put I put in the chat a uh, in, information on how you can contribute to our work of ICSS and the Niebuhr Proctor Library, which is our um, physical home. And I hope we'll be getting back to it soon. Um, I've been asked to um, suggest to people who have been contributing or want to contribute that they, instead of large contributions, although we're certainly happy to get them, uh, people uh, schedule through their um, bill pay, uh, um, recurrent contributions, recurrent payments, $5 a month, $10 a month, $20 a month. And um, um, it's a very painless and you can even do it while, you can set it up while you're listening to the uh, question and answers. So you won't be taking it any extra time and you'll be done with it for the next X number of years. So anyway, thank you all for your attention and thank you for your support. Thank you both. So now we're going to be open to um, open to questions. Um, Mehmet, I'm looking for the speaker view. I don't. It should be on top. Oh, okay, right now it is. Side. Okay, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it seemed like it was stuck with Richard. Thank you. I think we're okay now. Um, Richard does that. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do is um, I actually have Raj as the first person on the stack because the host can't raise their hands for some reason. So, but everyone else should be able to just raise your hand. So you can, depending on which version of Zoom you have, um, you can go to the participants window and there's a raise hand button there or under reactions, there is a raised hand button. So keep, feel free to ask any questions and just raise your hands and we'll go from there. Um, so Raj, you're, you have the floor now. Uh, before we go to Raj, uh, uh, on the new version under the reactions, even the hosts or co-hosts can raise oh, a hand. Okay. Yeah, I'm they sorry, updated that recently. That. No, no, that's a recent update. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Uh, can I take 30 seconds because Jean asked me to say something about next Sunday? Sure. 
Okay, so next Sunday, what I'm going to attempt to do, and it's a work in progress, so there will be more participation, I hope, is to examine, uh, we know that capitalism is a disaster for planetary ecology. And so how we can redefine our lives under socialism so that socialism could be the solution for it. So that's about that much. So I hope everybody will think about it and we can have a conversation on it after I speak next week. So back to Phyllis. Phyllis, I wanted to uh, tell you that I was in Chicago uh, and I was 1A in the draft before I got uh, out of uh, having to go to Vietnam. And I had told the sergeant when I went for my medical <laughs> examination, who was a black sergeant, he asked me, oh, you ready to get shipped to Nam? I said, yes, I am. And as soon as I arrive there, I'll switch sides. And he just laughed at me. He looked at me and spindly little kid uh, from Asia saying things like that. But, you know, my sense about the Vietnam War in other wars, the effective uh, resistance to war really comes when, when you have the force to shut down something that the war makers um, need. So uh, in Vietnam, the soldiers were turning guns again against their officers. In uh, working class was shutting down uh, the ports. The dislocation in, in production was going on because it had reached that point. Of course, the anti-war movement had much to do with popularizing and you know making people aware of it. So anti-war movement is very, very important. But its success requires that. Now, the unions were not, as my I recall, unions were by and large not supporting the peace movement at that time. As students leading it because they had to go. That shifted and it has been very difficult since that time to be effective in stopping the war. Okay, they, they you know, make a noise and yeah, you can go to Congress, they'll pass a resolution and things like that, but effectively stopping. So the next war, we must stop. I mean, <laughs> whether it's against China or any other country, the peace movement must do it. So I want you to kind of, uh, uh, share your thoughts on, on that aspect of it. Thank you very much for your very informative talk and I will listen. So, Thanks, Raj. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Phyllis. Um, you raise really important points. I think, I don't think I would say that the anti-war movement around Vietnam stopped the war. I think the Vietnamese won the war. They beat the US. I think we helped. We helped by making the price higher in the US, the political price higher. Uh, that, was, that was important. I, but I don't think if, if it had been left to us, I think, um, the, you know, luckily the Vietnamese had the power of a massive mobilization of, of society to take up arms uh, against this occupation and, and attack. And, and they had, you know, they were able, they're, they're, was the possibility of getting weapons from China and from the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, all of those things that don't really exist now that are so different. International solidarity was something different then because we, you know, we supported the other side. It I don't want to diminish for one minute the importance of the anti-war movement in that struggle. I think it was huge. Um, and part of it had to do with losing the battle of legitimacy as my friend Richard Falk likes to, to, to frame it, you know, that it's true that the US went to war in Iraq in 2003 in the face of visible, undeniable and undenied uh, massive opposition, public opposition. And yet they went to war anyway, but it made it harder. It made it harder that there was this global opposition. It made it harder for other governments to engage. So the raw power that they were able to bring to bear ultimately can be deployed still, but it's not the same as going to war with public support. And particularly now when, 
access to information is so much broader and access to disinformation, of course, makes all of that harder. But when they can't keep things secret, um, you know, the bombing of Laos, that was, it was the most bombed country on earth, uh, would never have been, it would never have stayed secret if that was going on today. It doesn't mean that we necessarily would have been able to stop it, but it would not have, it would not have been, oh, I'm, I'm getting back feedback from somebody who's uh, not, I don't know, so I think somebody is uh, not muted. Um, I think that, you know, it's a very different, we face a very different situation. I think that the fragging that went on, the killing of officers in Vietnam, the, the um, turn towards anti-war views among troops was really disturbing and really problematic for the command in, in Vietnam and in theater. But it had not yet, by the time the Vietnamese won, it had not yet, in my view, gotten to the point where that was a military threat. The actual numbers of, of fraggings were very, very low. And it was a lot the sort of cultural resistance that was underway, particularly among black troops. Um, so, you know, I think those things are important, but I don't think that, um, you know, I think when we talk about ending the next war, you're absolutely right. I mean, it could be, I think the two most likely are, uh, well, the two, the, mo the one most likely I think is Iran. That's what I'm very worried about. I don't think a, a war, a shooting war with China is very likely. I don't think either the US or China ruling circles are looking for that. The problem is they face a situation uh, as is the case with Iran, where they don't have what exists right now, for example, between the US and Russia in Syria. In, in Syria, both Russia and the US are perfectly fine with killing Syrians. Neither of them have any problem with that. But both of them are worried about killing each other's soldiers. So they have one of these hotlines that the US, I mean, the last time the US apparently only gave this, the, the Russians five minutes and they were complaining about it, even though they didn't have any soldiers wherever it was. Um, but they have the ability to immediately uh, respond and say, that was a mistake. We, this is not an act of war, we're pulling back. They don't have that capacity with Iran. They don't have it with China. So the possibility of in the very crowded uh, Strait of Hormuz or in the South China Sea where there are warships of both sides very up against each other it's very, very dangerous that, you know, late one night, some, some young sailor on a ship in, in the Strait of Hormuz sees a flare and thinks it's an attack and thinks, I've got a second, I'm gonna respond. The US doesn't have any way to, to call Tehran and say, that was a stupid mistake, we're sorry, we, we didn't mean that. You know, they'd have to wake up the Swiss ambassador and tell him to go to the, to the defense ministry and tell somebody, it just wouldn't happen. So it's, it's really very dangerous in those ways. And, and the answer to that, I think, is it's all about education. It's about mobilizing people before those wars, mobilizing to say why a new Cold War that's already underway with China is so dangerous because Cold Wars can get hot really quickly. Okay, um, I, have a, I have a pretty long stack now. Uh, I'm gonna call on Jean and then Richard <laughs> W, Rich J, Jerry and Roger. Jeez. Go ahead, Gene. Okay, well, again, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this, this was very useful and informative. Um, I'm a member of uh, Veterans for Peace, which as you know, is the, an educational and humanitarian organization dedicated to the abolishment of war. Not, we are opposed to every individual war, but over and above that, to the abolishment of war itself. And personally, I think the only way we're gonna do that is to abolish capitalism and um, imperialism. But I, was, I joined the Marines back in 1957 um, and got out in 1960. So I was in after Korea and before Vietnam. And that wasn't the brightest thing I've ever done joining the Marines, but it wasn't the dumbest either. But um, you know, my line on that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that um, uh, I may be an atheist, but I still thank God that she never sent me into combat because I've seen, particularly you know, with my comrades in our local 
East Bay chapter, what, what the war has done to them. And uh, uh, one guy in particular, he was in Vietnam uh, in the thick of things. He got out, he was okay for about 10 years, but then it hit him. He lost his job, he lost his family. Uh, he became homeless, uh, alcoholic, drugs, but it took him a long time to put himself to pull himself together, and he's one of more you know really important in both in terms of um, homeless veterans and deported veterans, which is another thing that we're very concerned about. So um, again, I think it's really important, and I really appreciate what you've been saying, and I'm glad um, our local chapter has been primarily concerned, we have a lot of Asians in San Francisco and here in Oakland, and uh, concerned with the, the threat of war against um, uh, China, the whole anti-China thing that's go, been going on for centuries, or at least a century, since the Opium War. They, you know, they didn't invite that either. either so, um, but I, I, And I appreciate the comments you made. I don't know if you want to elaborate on them, uh, because we're, you know, we're active in the no new Cold War on China. And that's important because they are a nuclear power. And uh, um, so anyway, yeah, to say, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. I, I mean, that is so important. I'm very proud that I am a lifetime member, lifetime honorary member of Veterans for Peace. Um, and I, I'm very grateful for that. I think that all of the issues that you're raising is are critical, and I'm I'm so grateful to to VFP for its role in helping to mentor the younger people from the post 9/11 wars when they created first Iraq Veterans Against the War and what's now known as About Face Veterans Against War. Um, they learned a lot from all of you about how to organize veterans, how to link the uh, the issues of PTSD and and uh, healthcare and all of those needs of veterans with the particular role that veterans play in building a movement against war. So I'm always grateful for the, the role of the veterans within that movement. It really strengthens what we do. Okay, next up is Richard W. And I found the unmute finally. Uh, first off, thank you for the uh, presentation. Not sure what I'm looking at. Um, uh, and you're with the IPS, so you, you may know my friend Tim Shorrock, mm -hmm. um, who I'm trying to get off of his couch and give a presentation here on Korea or maybe something else. But um, I have a whole bunch of notes here. <laughs> uh, I don't know where to start. Well, we're, um, you have two minutes, so. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I've got to, first off, I'm not so sanguine to, about uh, about war not starting, I'm afraid it's already started with the uh, with a missile attack in Syria, um, and I'm afraid that, that um, everything we worried about with Joe Biden uh, is 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 already in less than a month uh, starting to, to to show its ugly side. Um, I wanted to get back to um, a couple of points. One is 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 we're, we're various shades of Marxist here. Um, and, and, and and given that uh, we sort of we sort of go back to the roots of labor, and uh, you, you you didn't mention anything about uh, the labor movement used to be uh, used to be a, uh, a a collective it used to be a place for people to get skills for organizing, and that seems to have uh, uh, dropped off dramatically, um, and I was wondering if maybe. I mean, it's, that seems to especially have happened post Vietnam. Um, the other thing I wanted to I'll just, I've got, like I said, I got a bunch of notes. The other thing I, I think that you, you sort of uh, left out is the importance of George, uh, which one, which George Herbert Walker Bush, the, the, the first one, um, who really set, uh, who really set an agenda uh, to get us out of the so called Vietnam syndrome. Um, and to make war uh, more uh, more plausible to to the, to the, to the population, uh, he did that. You know, in various steps. Uh, one of the things, of course, is the is the shift from a draft to a to a, a quote volunteer, uh, an economic you know uh, a draft, if you will. 
uh, military. Anyways, I'll stop there and maybe uh, I can bring up a few um, uh, other points uh, later on. Thank you. Yes, you can get called on again. <laughs> After we go through the, the stack of first time speakers. Uh, the next person is Richard Johnson. Um, so, uh, thank you. Yeah, this has been great. Um, so, uh, Phyllis, uh, this is Rich Johnson, and uh, briefly, and then my wife is going to speak after me. She was on the same phone, and uh, sorry I'm not up in there in the picture, but uh, I've changed a lot. But anyway, I first met Phyllis in, um, I'm going to say around 71 or 2, I'm not sure exactly the year, uh, but Phyllis had been working on the Pentagon Papers, and uh, and I was in the Indochina Peace Campaign, which I always thought of Phyllis as part of the Indochina Peace Campaign, but technically I'm not sure if that was true. But I know that I met her then and heard her speak and became aware of her, and I just follow, have followed you ever since. And uh, every time I get a chance, not, not closely, but... <laughs> Every time I hear you're going to speak or something, I make sure that I'm there, uh, whether it's wherever. And uh, so anyway, I just want to say hi. Uh, I really, I loved your presentation today. I thought your voice was so clear. I thought, yeah, there's Phyllis. So clear. Each thing, you, I was thinking, everything you're saying, you're so, the level is so high, but you are so clear. It's actually understandable, you know. <laughs> And that didn't surprise me, but I just couldn't kind of say, you know, not all speakers are that clear. Let me put it that way, especially myself. So anyway, I'd like to introduce you to you. <laughs> you're welcome. Introduce you to my wife, Kit, and uh, she's got whatever to say. She likes to speak, and I like to hear her talk, so I can shut up. Here you go. Hey, hi, Phyllis. Yeah, we've been following you for a long time. I really appreciate when you're on Democracy Now! and or any media outlet where you're doing your analysis. Um, and I really appreciate your optimism because it's we've seen all these ups and downs going on with the, how things have been over history, and you've got definitely the history down uh, of a lot of information. Um, the, the, I think what's going on in Oakland uh, regarding the uh, anti-Chinese uh, racism and uh, what uh, um, has to do with the uh, movement against the war um, – it, with China, if you know, I mean, there is a movement against that. Um, locally, Oakland, uh, the blacks, black community members of the black community and Asians have um, are actually uniting together, working against that. So that's optimistic. Uh, the thing about the fire drill Fridays, I thought that was Greenpeace, not Sierra Club with Jane You're Fonda. Right. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Did I say Sierra Club? No, it was Greenpeace. Yeah. The great Annie Leonard. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Ooh, so glad that's you caught yeah, I, because I, I did hear her, her speak. And um, anyway, um, let's see. Uh, and then the thing about the Occupy movement um, being compared to Arab Spring, there was a lot of that going on in the U.S. at the time. And there is, you know, a level of maturity that the movement has to go through with between the young people getting involved and the veteran people get, that are already there. Um uh, there needs to be more education. Uh, Egypt is not the U.S. And people were, it just seemed like a lot of folks were just uh, merging those two, like the the movements within those countries were, you know, just too similar. And it's like, no, no, there's, there's differences that need to be, you know, brought out. You brought up the issue about the military, you know, the role the military plays. So anyway, that's just one point. But my Biggest question has to do with COVID and the uh, environment and um, COVID is forcing us a new challenge where we have to be more creative. There's more technology transitioning taking place. The digital divide limits, uh, did the digital divide limits participation for some who can't, you know, uh, update or, you know, keep up with the technology. Like a lot of seniors are in that position or people who uh, don't have the, you know, the, who are, you know, poor, who don't have the uh, economic ability to uh, stay in touch with what's going on. Right now, it's a really tough time. Um, and also, the technology is so energy dependent where climate change uh, can disrupt um, our our technology. So um, anyway, I just want you to comment on, on those things. Thank you very much for your work. <laughs> 
Um, Phyllis, it's okay if you want to accumulate a couple, a few questions and then get back, whatever you want to do. Um, I, there's been a couple that linked a couple questions, so maybe I can do that. Um, one is this issue around war and racism, basically, the, the intersections. That's always been um, a, a feature of U.S. wars. I suppose it is everywhere, um, but I'm most familiar with it in this country, going back to the genocidal wars against the indigenous people in this country to, to get their land that was accompanied by this propaganda about Native Americans as savages, as uncivilized. Uh, there was a religious component to it. Reverend Barber likes to talk about the, um, the doctrine of discovery, which was a papal announcement that any land that is uh, populated by people who are not Christians is perfectly fine for Christians to take it because they're Christian. And that was, that was used as justification for a whole level of, of global uh, land theft through colonialism. Um, I think that what we are seeing now in terms of anti-Asian racism being on, on, the, on the escalating side, the New York Times just had a big piece on it, the Washington Post did, uh, it's really emerging nationally, uh, these attacks on individual Asians walking down the street, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is rising. And I think that is a very dangerous sign because it makes, of course, it makes war with China easier. It doesn't make the, the drivers of going to war different because, but it, it sets the terms that if they choose to, it will be easier to gain public acceptance for it. So I think it is something that we really do need to, to uh, focus on. I think that some of the work Tim Shorrock and the others do in organizations like Women Cross the DMZ, uh, which involve both Korean women and other women, has been really, really important in humanizing what are we talking about when we talk about the Korean Peninsula, that we're not just talking about <coughs> North Korea means Kim Jong Un and South Korea means technology and our guys, you know, it's a whole people that have been artificially divided and the question of denuclearizing the whole peninsula also means the US has to stop sending its own nuclear weapons in uh, on, on ships and that sort of thing. So I think these um, kinds of campaigns become uh, really, really important. And then just finally, and what one of the things Richard W said around the labor movement and training, I think that's absolutely right. But I think, you know, we're looking at an era of, uh, of, of um, uh, the demise of manufacturing, the demanufacturing components of, of the US economy mean that it's not the only reason, but it's a big part of the reason why the numbers of people, the percentages of workers who are in unions is so low. And the vast majority of people that are in unions are public workers, public service workers, where it's not in, in production, it's in service stuff. So it's a very different, uh, a very different kind of engagement. Um, that we're looking at. But I think that one of the things that we do have on the good side, uh, looking at that is a host of new and not so new organizations, various kinds of nonprofits that are focusing on doing training for young activists so that when people get out of, out of school, when, they, when they're done with school, whatever, they can get training for various kinds of activities. There's, there's certainly training in some of the unions in organizing, but also a bunch of other things like the Midwestern Academy and you know, all kinds of institutions that people's movements have created, the Highlander Center, um, all exist to do that kind of training of activists. And this year, I think, in the context of the pandemic and the election, we saw a whole crew of, of young people getting training in electoral stuff, which hadn't been part of our movements for a long time. There had been, and there still is, a divide between the electoral kind of the movement and street mobilizations, but there's more and more coming together uh, where people from organizations like Justice Democrats and others are looking for people who come out of movements to run for office. And so that we're, we're gonna have to learn as a movement what our friends and our comrades in Latin America and parts of Europe have already learned that when you get people coming out of movements and running for office, when they win, they know how to, they know how to work in building coalitions inside parliamentary situations. And what we have to learn on the outside is how best to use that, that positioning that, that we win for them. 
I don't think we know that very well yet. Okay, uh, Jerry is next. Jerry Morgan. Please unmute yourself, Jerry. By star nine, I believe. Uh, star nine uh, on the uh, phone. Star, star six. Oh, there Am you are yes. now. Yes, you are. Yes, okay, you are. sorry, I didn't know how to look it. And thank you, Phyllis, for a really fine presentation. I um I have an interest in a casual interest in stories that disappear, that that people you know that are, that are that seem to me good stories, and that people that I think know more about it than me and are honest, all of a sudden it disappears. One of the examples would be the Lancet study in in uh, of about a decade ago, the epidemiological study about deaths in in Iraq, and I just know it disappeared with people that I really respect just not talking about it anymore. I, I don't give it authority anymore, but I don't know what happened that it disappeared. I thought maybe you would be one of those people who I think know a lot more about it than me and are honest that could maybe have some answers. Well, just on that one, I mean, I, I'm not sure about the article disappearing. I think what, what happened is that a lot of the people that were doing a lot of work on sanctions, myself included, once the second Iraq war began and the Afghan war, and then shortly after the global war on terror and Iran and Syria and Somalia and Libya, it, it was a matter of priorities. I think those of us who had been working primarily on sanctions turned towards stopping military, military wars, weapons wars. Sanctions is an act of war. Sanctions are war by another, uh, another um, method, but that's, you know, a lot of people turn towards that. I, I don't think there's any more conspiracy about it than that. I'm sure at the government level, they're very happy that there's not so many people working on the impact of sanctions because they keep using them. We're seeing it now in Iran, we're seeing it in Venezuela. Um, but I think that the, the diminished focus of people using that study and others uh, to keep the focus on is, is still needed. It's absolutely still needed. Um, but I think it's more just that there's, only 24 hours every day to do that work. And it's, it's more that than anything else. Thank you. Um, next is Roger Harris. Well, thank you, Phyllis, for your presentation. I found it informative to hear your analysis on the anti-war movement. And I agree with a large part, part of it, and particularly the objective to build the movement. I, I felt that in some ways you rendered the, the the presence and influence of the Democratic Party um, almost invisible. And I, I, I see it that it's, you know, maybe a question of perspective from Washington that's a little different from this perspective from California. But I want, wanted to get into that role of the Democratic Party and get your thoughts about it. Because now the chief imperialist in the world is, is Joe Biden on um, February 19th, when he was in Munich and made his major foreign policy speech, he said, America is back. And he um, made it very clear that intervention will be increased. And that Anthony um, Lincoln, when he did his um, hearings, and his, he said that he will be continuing and extending the, the Trump um, policies. So, I, I, I know many of you folks um, do support Biden and had supported him in the election, but how will you try to move, develop a movement who will then have to say, we have to take on the Biden presidency, in particular, the, the groups that you said that, were, that you were um, optimistic about? Um, I, I believe that all of them um, either implicitly or, or explicitly supported the Biden presidency. Yet at some point, if we have to build a anti-war movement, we really have to take on the chief imperialist. So I, I'd appreciate hearing from you on, on, on that strategic issue. Sure, this is a key issue. I, I did not support Biden. Nobody I know supported Biden. When he got the nomination, we did support, lots of people supported building an anti-fascist front, which included Biden as the lesser evil. 
In my view, elections for president in this country are always elections about lesser evils. There was a possibility with Bernie Sanders of having a presidential campaign who would not be a lesser evil, who would actually be somebody we supported. But as we know, that didn't happen. And in my experience, that's never happened, that the actual candidate is somebody we support as opposed to somebody who's not as bad as the other guy. And I happen to think that for people at the, at the bottom end of either the US economic hierarchy or the global, the rest of the world under US bombs, it matters a great deal whether it's the worst or the not quite as worst. Those are huge differences. Those are life and death. So that, yeah, I, I wanted Biden to win desperately because the alternative <coughs> wasn't Bernie Sanders. The alternative was four more years of, of Donald Trump empowering fascism around the world and fascist movements at home. So yeah, in that sense, I supported Biden in that context. But I think that what's more important than Biden is the political moment in which he gets elected. There's never been the kind of split in the Democratic Party that, there has, that we've seen over the last several years. There's never been as big a divide among electeds between the, the, the progressive wing of the party and the centrist or right wing of the party that Biden leads. We're seeing it in places that we never saw in recent years where the people being appointed to various positions and the announcements of particularly the, that first week of uh, executive orders showed the degree to which people in and around the Biden administration recognized who put them into office, which was black women. That's who elected Biden and, and, and Harris. And they know that, and they have to take that into account. So in a number of arenas, most notably in climate, in immigration, a little bit in some of the economic stuff, although that's not clear how far it will go, um, you see real shifts where it's, you know, it's not like they're coming to us and saying, who do you want? You know, obviously that's not the case. We still stand for a whole other set of things than, than US imperialism does. But what we also have to acknowledge is that in that context, the gap between the progressive wing and the right wing and the influence of movements is the, is the least when it comes, well, the greatest gap and the least influence when it comes to foreign policy. So that's where we're seeing, and, and a number of us have written about this for, for months now, that that's where we're going to see the biggest challenge. Number one, it's not going to be first on their agenda other than around Iran, which is what this bombing in Syria was all about, um, for as long as they can put it off. Their priorities are around the pandemic and around the economic crisis. That's, who they're, that's what they're answering to, and that's what, they're, that's what their focus is going to be. The climate stuff, they have appointed some very good people, not so much, um, what's his name, uh, uh, Kerry, but the woman who's the domestic uh, uh, energies are, McKen uh, not Mackenzie, Mick something, I'm forgetting her name. Uh, she is way better. And the climate justice activists are very excited about her. She doesn't come out of the movements, but she's somebody who's open to far more ideas and far more um, uh, motion on that. The same is likely true on immigration, although we're not gonna see it right away because that one's much harder to impose instantly. But some of the people that they've put in place also rep represent people that movements around immigrant rights have played a major part in, in supporting the candidacies. You have to remember that Biden has just uh, uh, deported a number of Haitians and other people against the campaign. As I said, we are not going to see. The, really, right. what I've asked you is how to build it, the movement when it has to oppose Biden. I don't think there's any issue on which people are not opposing Biden. The, the immigrant rights movement has been out in the streets opposing Biden right. already. They're not waiting. The anti-war forces, I mean, you've read some of the stuff that people have been writing, including me and others, about the bombing on Friday. Nobody's waiting to give uh, give him a honeymoon. The chant in the streets has been no honeymoon, no honeymoon. So, I mean, you know, I don't live in the Bay Area anymore. And the Bay Area to me was always a wonderful place to live because it is so invested in 
representing the left in this country. Most of this country isn't that. And Congress isn't that. What we do have for the first time are real progressives in Congress that are not isolated individuals, but that are coming together. Now, what are they gonna focus on? Most of them are not focusing on foreign policy and they're not going to. Most of our movements are not focusing on foreign policy and they're not going to. Black Lives Matter is not going to take the lead in mobilizing against the bombing of Syria. They'll maybe activists will participate who are also part of, but so this comes back to us. Which movements were able to play a major role in pressuring and in getting out the vote against Trump? It wasn't us. It wasn't the, the anti-militarism, anti-war movements. So, you know, we have to be very, very conscious about all that. I think that we're going to have a very hard time. There's been some good indicators. The appointment of Wendy Sherman as the um, uh, second in command at the State Department, I thought was a very good sign relative to going back into the nuclear deal. She was the architect of the nuclear deal the first time around. She's very invested in it. And Biden wants it. He wants it because it was, it was the best thing that Obama got credit for, and he wants to make sure he gets credit for that. So he wants to go back to that. The, the fight that's going on between Biden and Blinken and all the other reindeer in the State Department is focused on this issue of how much are we prepared to spend? How much political capital are we prepared to give up to get into, back into the nuclear deal? That's a very different debate than should we go back into the nuclear deal? I'm glad it's this, but it's still very dangerous. And right now it's looking like the people that are saying we should not spend anything in political capital are the ones that are in the lead. I'm hoping that that doesn't remain. I don't think we can make a judgment on it yet. The, the one uh, set of bombings on, on, uh, uh, on Friday doesn't tell us that. It tells us at, it's a snapshot of that moment. It doesn't tell us more. So I think you know, this is a very difficult challenge, but I, I would disagree with you that people are not challenging Biden. People are challenging Biden all over the place. We don't yet see massive demonstrations in the street and we're not going to. I frankly don't think it, particularly in the context of the pandemic, we're not gonna see any big demonstrations and we shouldn't. It puts people's lives at risk. But I think that the notion that that's the only basis on which to say that people are or are not challenging Biden is wrong. I think that there's been lots of stuff written. There've been petitions. There's three separate petitions circulating against the bombing, all of which talk about how this is, this is the, the most negative way he could possibly begin his administration. Um, so I don't know anybody who's kind of waiting to say, well, let's not challenge anything yet. Let's wait until we see what he does. The willingness to spend some political capital to appoint Rob Malley um, was a very important signal. Now, Rob hasn't had a minute to do anything yet. We'll see what he's able to do. He's not obviously gonna be an independent actor. He's gonna be representing the Biden administration. But he's somebody who knows better than most what sanctions have done to Iran, what it means to recognize national interests in the other side, which neither Biden nor Obama were ever willing to do. Um, so there's a lot of indicators on both sides. And I think we just don't know yet which way this is going to play out. And we have to keep up the pressure. So I would urge everybody, and I have been, to keep up the pressure, keep up the pressure on members of Congress. But the reality is neither Congress nor the administration is going to be spending time politically. Doesn't mean they're not gonna be bombing places, they are. But they're not going to be making that the debate in Congress. The, the goal of cutting the military budget, which last year won 97 votes in the House, which was huge. There had never been a vote of more than five or 10 for cutting the military budget, not just, and that was for a tiny cut. That was for a 10% cut, right? And we're gonna, we're gonna get that again this year. We'll have another vote. I'm hoping it'll be about 110 this time, but it's not gonna win. So anybody who thinks that, you know, that we can somehow win those votes in Congress isn't paying attention to what exists on the ground. What are important issues even for the most progressive members of Congress, let alone, and it comes back ultimately to our movements. This is all about the movements. And we don't yet have anything near what the the environmental justice movement has, what the immigrant rights movement has, the women's movement, the LGBT movements, they are head and shoulders above all of us when it comes to weighing where there can be real influence 
on either Congress or the administration on any of these issues. We're way behind. Okay, next up is Rich Fallenbaum, followed by Yusuf, Norma, and Susan and Michael. Jeez. <laughs> That's a question. Well, I, uh, um, well, I don't know if your 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 um, uh, presentation was so optimistic. You seem to say that these these left movements are really not interested in an anti-imperialist. Um, no, well, no. you, I know you said you said contradictory things. Mm -hmm. There are other, they have other priorities, right. which is the same thing. And I wonder, I wonder what you think um, about the this emergence and actually it went back to the Vietnam War of a kind of mainstream conservative um, deplorables um, anti-imperialist movement anti-war movement you know too many wars anti name you know the, the kind of thing that Trump the kind of people that Trump tapped into is this a significant group of people and if so why hasn't anybody tried to mobilize them that's what my question. And then finally, I think it's a mistake to equate Russia and China, uh, Russia and the United States and Syria in any way. There's, there's a world of difference. Um, uh, the United States is the aggressor. Uh, um, Russia is attempting to defend the sovereignty of, of Syria and, and actually to bring an end to that war with all parties. So just a caution on that point. Thank you. Thank you. On the, well, on the second one first, um, we can differ on Syria. I think that that is what Russia will say. I think if you look to people who live in Raqqa, whose city was destroyed by the United States, they would be saying more or less the same thing as the people who live in Aleppo, whose city was destroyed by the government of Syria, Russia, and Iran. I don't think there's much difference. Um, I, I think the motivations are somewhat different but I think the impact on people and people's lives, and that's what these days, that's what I look at more, um, is, is um, critically important. I don't think that they're doing the same thing, but I think the impact on people is the same. Um, the other question though, I think it is absolutely contradictory. I, I think it is a huge contradiction and it, it's not an easy one to resolve. I think there are lots of organizations, including all the ones I mentioned, who are in fact, and you know, we meet with the leaders of these organizations all the time and they, they say, yeah, God, we'd like to do stuff around wars and around military spending. This is impacting our communities more than anybody else, but we just don't have the bandwidth to take on one more issue. And it's on us and we haven't done it well enough yet to provide the easily accessible analysis and talking point. We've done tons of that. I mean, I spend half my life writing talking points for various movements and whatever, as do lots of people around the country. And that's really important, but we haven't as a movement as an anti-war movement, we haven't yet figured out ways to make that work inherently easy for other movements to take on. When there, was a, when there was a legal draft, it was easier. The poverty draft is harder because we can talk about it as a poverty draft, a draft of no option, a, a healthcare draft when there's no other way to get healthcare. But the reality is that means it is an answer to the lack of jobs, the lack of healthcare. That is what people can do. So it makes that harder. There's, it's harder in all kinds of ways. Um, so I think it is a contradiction. It's one that can only be resolved by furthering our work towards intersectionality. And we have to be really careful not to be um, judgmental, if you will, about you know, you can't be part of our movement unless you also check off all these other boxes. You know, you can't fight for women's rights unless you have the right line on racism, trans rights, immigration, et cetera. We use the broad movements, the women, broad women's movement, the broad anti-war movement, all of these movements to do the kind of public and popular education that makes people take on other understandings as well. You know, so that that's to me, that's what intersectionality really means. That's what when when the Poor People's Campaign talks about the fusion movement that they're building, that's what it talks about is providing information that makes clear the links between all of these various oppressions. I think in our movement, sometimes there's a tendency to judge people instead, to, to make it a, a red line, if you will, in our movements that 
you can't really be part of the Palestinian rights movement or the immigrant rights movement or whatever, unless you also agree on five other things. This is a moment for me when we need broad popular fronts. We also need more conscious elements working within our movements, but that's not, that's not what's gonna change opinion enough to change elections and challenge power. We need to reach huge numbers of people. And that means really big tents, bringing in all kinds of people who disagree with us on all kinds of things. Now, the notion of the people who identify with Trump's version of why we shouldn't have wars because those countries are not worth one drop of our blood, there's a, an explicit racism in that, which I find abhorrent. And, you know, it's there that it's not a movement. It's not something he's ever tried. Even Trump didn't try to mobilize around that. Certainly, it's a popular view that says we shouldn't waste money abroad. We should be, you know, we should be spending the money here. I find it a little tricky sometimes with a lot of my colleagues who work a lot on, on military budget issues. I don't mean my, my friends at IPS, but in, in the movement in general, there's lots of people who work on challenging US military spending, you know, $740 billion a year for the military budget, 53 cents of every federal dollar. It's, it's an outrage. And there's a tendency to want to say the best way to stop that is to say that we need that money at home to create a Green New Deal, to, to pay for Medicare for all, to provide jobs, to pay for college education. And that's all true. And it's also true that we need to stop doing that so we stop killing people abroad. Those two things have to go together and it's hard because people whose focus, the movements, these incredible movements that are focusing on the fight for 15 or, or ending police violence against African-Americans, their focus is on bringing home that attention. And we have to figure out ways to build movements that respect all of that and include internationalism within them. It's, it's not, there's no easy way out that I can see. It's really hard. Uh, next is Yusuf. Um, okay, uh, so you hear me? Yes. And uh, uh, can I just uh, ask people who've already spoken to lower your hands? It's, it's hard to figure out the stack with extra hands raised. <laughs> Go ahead, Yusuf, please. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I missed a, a little bit of the Q&A due to a computer glitch, but um, a, the, well, I, I have two, two, two comments and they are slash questions. Uh, one, uh, it, it, it vaguely relates to the issue of Syria and Russia uh, raised here is that I think that the um, uh, problem facing, principal problem facing the anti-war movement now is that uh, the, um, the establishment, the U.S. establishment, uh, uh, partly uh, because of many former uh, anti-war activists and leftists uh, uh, getting jobs in the uh, establishment, uh, ha has known how to phrase uh, their interventions in a way that will uh, appeal and uh, uh, win over to a certain extent or muddy the waters uh, of the uh, issues uh, under the uh, uh, banner of so-called humanitarian intervention. Uh, I would like uh, some comments about that. N number two, um, uh, uh, I, the, uh, concerning UFPJ and answer, uh, I was involved uh, uh, both in the uh, first Iraq war and the second Iraq war. In the first Iraq war, uh, Saddam Hussein was an issue because uh, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, uh, answer didn't exist. Uh, but uh, but uh, the, the Soviet Union was uh, in the process of dissolving and uh, uh, basically out of the picture. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, we, some of the um, uh, sections of the left uh, did uh, make Saddam still an issue. Uh, 
the, in the second Iraq war was, I remember Saddam, well, Saddam was overthrown and, uh, uh, and then executed. So uh, I think there was broad agreement that the issue was not Saddam. Uh, but I think the problem between UFPJ and Answer, uh, uh, from experience, is that uh, Answer wanted to uh, raise uh, a, a whole list of uh, left issues. UFPJ, on the other hand, was quite enamored uh, of, of the very uh, across-the-board support, as you pointed out, uh, uh, against the war. Uh, and uh, they were opposing uh, any mention of uh, the issues, they, even the, if they happened to agree with them. Uh, and, and mostly they did agree on those issues, but they just didn't want them raised because um, uh, they, 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 they didn't want the, uh, uh, the very broad coalition, which included right-wing people. It included uh, uh, many supporters um, of Israel. Israel. So could you please comment on that? Yeah, that's, a, I mean, there's a lot to comment on, but just briefly, I would say that, um, I mean, I think there were differences over Saddam Hussein in both the first Gulf War and in the Iraq War of 2003. Uh, but I think that that was, you're right, that was not the only issue at, at stake. It was what kind of a coalition? Is it a broad popular front or is it a much narrower left uh, um, coalition? I mean, I was at a couple of answer demonstrations where I talked to people who didn't really know what the coalition was. They, they, weren't, they weren't getting an a political education there. They were brought in for one issue and, and were seeing stuff that they found confusing. I don't find that a good method of organizing, but that's just my opinion. Um, but I do think that UFPJ went through enormous um, shifts. At the very beginning, it, it was incredibly broad. And yes, it was a one issue coalition. It was designed to be that. It was designed to be as broad as possible. Um, on the question of Palestine, there was a several years long process of education that went on within the steering committee and within the coalition more broadly that led to a joint sponsorship in 2007 between United for Peace and Justice and what was then called the US campaign to end the Israeli occupation. The first um, national demonstration against the occupation held on, at the Capitol. Uh, it was on the 50th anniversary of the 67 occupation. Um, and it was co-sponsored by UFPJ with the US campaign. And that came after several years of folks, I was one of them from the US campaign, working with the, uh, the, the um, uh, steering committee of the broader coalition to make clear what the links were uh, between the war in Iraq and US support for the Israeli occupation. And that worked and we had, it wasn't a huge demonstration because it was the first of its kind. There were, I think some, seven or 8,000 people or something, but it was, it was a good national demonstration. So it wasn't, it wasn't as absolute as that, that there was only answer did anything broader and UFPJ didn't do anything. Um, UFPJ took it slow, slower than I would have preferred at the time, but that was who was, it, it's what made the coalition stronger um, and made it possible to, to reach much more broadly uh, than would have been the case otherwise. And I think that's still the case with all of the kinds of popular fronts that we need to build on these issues. They overlap, we need to, uh, we, we need to reach all of the people in all of them about all of the other issues. I don't know that we in the, in the anti-war movement, particularly in those years when the issue that, was, that we were all most passionate about was the centerpiece of progressive mobilization overall, I don't think we did such a good idea, uh, such a good job of educating people particularly in the periphery of our own movement on issues around immigration, around uh, uh, racism, around all the other issues that so many other people were mobilizing around, around labor rights, et cetera. So I think all of our movements need to do better at figuring out ways to reach other movements with our issues the same way. Uh, I wasn't defending either. Uh, no, no, I understand I, that, I, yeah. That's fine. Uh, but could you comment on the first one? Uh, the, 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 there's this very much um, a, 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 um, a, the support uh, a, and, and always muddying the waters um, uh, a, 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 about this humanitarian intervention. Oh, yeah. saying, 
Right. I mean, that that was a hugely popular thing in, um, I think, in the Democratic Party and in the mainstream media. The UN later turned it into something called R2P, the responsibility to protect, because the term humanitarian intervention, particularly after uh, the Kosovo War in 1999, uh, became very unpopular. It became too visible that it was it was a, it was a, a screen for direct U.S. intervention. So they created this very complex system known as R2P, which was all designed to, you know, in theory, if, if you were looking at it sort of absent any context, it would look kind of good that there's like 15 steps for the world to take, whether the United Nations, uh, regional human rights institutes, all kinds of things, when there are issues of internal, massive internal human rights violations. And they all are involved with non-military responses and they go through one and then if that doesn't work you go on to the next and it's the, like number 18 you finally get to the possibility of military intervention only if another set of criteria are met. In the abstract it sounds great in the real world it was one more excuse for military intervention by the most powerful countries. So that never really got anywhere any, either except that it had a couple of years sort of notoriety as being something very popular and the UN still has an office of, of the responsibility to protect that. I don't know what they do. I don't think they do anything anymore because it's been pretty yeah, discredited too. Yeah, but I, I know, but I think this has influence on, on the um, uh, anti-war right. movement. It may have, I never saw that. Most of that happened after uh, the, the anti-war movement was already um, was already uh, fading in many ways, so. Thank, thank you, Yusuf. We, we're kept coming to the end of the formal program. And so I am going to call can on- Can I the speak program. while the program is Norma, still- I am about to tell you that you can speak. I am going to call on the last two people on the, on the stack, which is Norma and either Susan or Michael, whichever of you is on there. Thank you. Norma, you have two minutes. <laughs> can I take the same three minutes as some of the other speakers? Okay, uh, hi, uh, Phyllis. Um, I can't remember what it was you made you say that there was opposition to the Soviet uh, unions uh, coming into Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So I've written this uh, long. Yes, I read it. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's my point, and uh, that that the Soviet Union came to defend on the invitation of the uh, ousted Afghanis uh, uh, who were running that liberalized government. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like, I'd really like to hear what you had to say. I do, I do want to mention another post I put in here saying that the people in this country are so conditioned to revenge. I mean, they, they get it on the TV all the time and uh, uh, from the cradle, they get revenge. And they want that they have this perception, this mindless perception of being assaulted and attacked by all these people that need to be killed around the world, which buoys up the sense of the justification of making war on people around the world. And it's in their minds. And for which I preach, you know, socialism and communism is a good thing to bombard the world with. Keep saying it, keep explaining it, keep saying yes, you want health care, and yes, it's socialist, et cetera. Yeah, I'm, on your first point about Afghanistan, I mean, there's real differences among Afghans uh, about the Soviet intervention. There's differences on the timeline of whether oh, they came yeah. before or after the CIA, et cetera. But I think from my vantage point, one of the huge, I mean, it, there's no question that the kind of modernized uh, version of socialism that was imposed by the Soviet Union had support from a certain number of Afghans. The same is true right now, ironically enough, from a lot of the same people and their children uh, who support the US staying in Afghanistan because the US is claiming to support a modernization program, particularly the issue of women's rights, which were huge under the Soviet uh, rule and is significantly better in Kabul and Kandahar right now for women than it was under the Taliban government, which had, the, had ruled for the four Soviet years. The Soviet supported government. Yes, you're it, right. It, Soviet supported government. I, I knew a lot of the people in that Soviet supported government. Can I finish? Yes, right. Can I finish? Yes. 
my point is that I think, first of all, 80% of Afghans don't live in the cities. They haven't experienced the women's rights and the modernization either during the period of the Parcham government in, in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan, the Soviet supporting, the, the government that the Soviets supported, or now, they don't get that. Afghanistan is still the worst rated country in the world for infant mortality, for instance. So it hasn't helped. And part of the problem is that when I think what the Soviet Union tried to do at the time was to impose a national structure, a government that was rooted in, which is exactly what the US tried to do 25 years later, impose a nationally based structure in a country that had no history in its own culture of a nationally led government. Right. The governments were traditionally local, tribal, and regional, and not national. So the, these days, what's talked about in Afghanistan is the president of, of Afghanistan is known as the, as the mayor of Kabul, because that's as far as his brief extends. It's a huge challenge. People in Afghanistan are facing an enormous long series of challenges that includes the rights of women that they are going to have to fight for when and if the U.S. pulls out the question of what kind of negotiations will go on between the Afghan government, the US-backed Afghan government, and the Taliban is very unclear. But right now, the Taliban controls somewhere around 60% of the territory and somewhere close to 50% of the population. In many of those areas, people have been able to negotiate uh, for girls to go to school, for health care to be created in some level. But yes, it's worse for women under the Taliban than it is under the current government. The current government is made up of a bunch of other warlords that invented, among other things, uh, it was Gulbadin Hekmatyar. One of them was the one who invented throwing acid in the face of young women who had the temerity to say, I want to go to school. So both, you know, the, these um, Mujahideen who opposed the Soviet Union, and then they became the Washington's favorites in becoming the government that's there now. But what's challenging that government is not the modernist pro-Soviet socialist, the Parcham party, or the other party whose name I'm forgetting, there were two parties. Oh, Kalk. Kalk. Kalk party, right, thank you. Um, it's not either of those parties. Um, most of those people were killed off during that war, most of the, the comrades from the, from the communist parties. But the ones who are fighting back against the US presence are extreme Islamists, whose position on women is worse and whose position on the economy, et cetera, is pretty much the same. So it's, it's a disaster and, it's, and the question of pulling out US troops, I have a new piece that'll be out in the nation this week about Afghanistan that basically says, yes, of course we should pull out the last remaining 2,500 troops, but that's really not the point. The point is there's an air war going on that's killing people. The 2,500 troops are no longer actually killing people there. They're kind of irrelevant. They should be pulled out because they have no business being there. They're illegal, et cetera. And the real goal should be to end the war and Afghans are gonna have a huge complicated task to figure out for themselves what their government is going to be like. That's the same thing that we said 25 years, 50 years ago. Thank you, Norma. The, the final question is gonna come from either Susan or Michael. It's Susan, hi everybody. Um, I wanna bring the discussion back for a closing on movement building and, and the peace movement or anti-war movement or anti-imperialist movement. I'm one of a handful of people who uh, are working within East Bay DSA to build an a anti-war, anti-imperialist presence. And it's very difficult for all the reasons that you mentioned. Um, part of it is that the, the younger generation didn't experience the Vietnam War and doesn't know anything, you know, much about it or whatever the draft, et cetera. Or the draft, uh, right? Yeah. Um, but what what I want to ask you <clears throat> is if you could paint a picture of the movement as it is now. I'm aware, <clears throat> for example, of many groups and locally, Code Pink was the first to take up the the recent situation. And they're, they're out bannering right now on the freeway, above the freeway. So I, I'm very aware of what they're doing. <clears throat> and I'm aware of the poor people's movement. And I'm aware of group, national groups through my computer, uh, Peace Action and World Beyond War and, and or Live, whatever they are. There's just a bunch of groups, but it doesn't feel like a movement. And when 
people uh, refer to the movement, a peace movement as you have, um, other people say, no, it died, it's gone. So I'd, I'd like some parting words about how you see the movement and how these groups are relating to each other to strengthen them. Yeah, it, it's a really important question, Susan. I think that um, there's not enough communication within the movement. I think that a lot of the legacy organizations that have been around since Vietnam or before have their own styles of doing things, have not been great at reaching out to younger people, are overwhelmingly white. There's all kinds of problems. Um, the younger groups that are emerging now, I, I mentioned two of them, the dissenters and, and uh, um, what's the other one called, uh, Justice is Global, um, that are led by young people of color in different places and are working in a number of areas. There's also, you mentioned DSA, there's a lot of young people coming into DSA. It's a moment when socialism is kind of on the rise again, which is great. Um, the majority as I understand it, the majority work in DSA is more on a set of domestic issues, economic issues, climate justice, uh, immigration. There are people that are trying to set up uh, study groups on Palestine within DSA, study groups on, on uh, anti-war stuff in general. And I think all of that is great. I think, I, I still think that our most important work right now is going to be both, I mean, there's important work to be done with Congress because there's a, there's a bunch of new people who have been elected to Congress that are very progressive, but who mostly don't know very much about the foreign policy issues. It's not the movements they came out of. And they're gonna vote the wrong way because they don't know. And, and people in our movements are gonna blame them and say, she turned on us here and, and it's gonna be wrong because it's gonna be nobody bothered to go and meet with her staff, whoever she might be. You know, I'm talking generally about a lot of different people. So I think we have a lot of work to do with Congress um, I think we also have a lot, and we have a lot of work to do to support the people who are doing a good job. The work that Ro Khanna has done on Yemen, for instance, has been stellar. And I don't know how often people in and around his district in, in uh, Silicon Valley thank him for it. He does amazing work and should be thanked all the time. Um, but I also think that in terms of our movements, we need to be a lot more creative about how to reach all the other movements, how, you know, who's meeting with the leadership of, of the Movement for Black Lives, who's meeting with the leadership of 350.org, who's meeting with the Domestic Workers Alliance and CDP and, and all of these other organizations with Move On. We're, I'm, I'm hoping to talk with, with uh, Rana Epting next week from Move On about what we can do around uh, uh, if this bombing turns out to be the start of, of something more than a one-off message, which I'm hoping and partly thinking it, it may well be. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of work to do and it, we just have to keep remembering it's on us. We can't expect, you know, we're not the ones who, who respond every time we in the, in the anti-war, anti-imperialist movement are generally not the ones who respond every time a, a black woman is killed by police in some city. We're not the ones who are out, out at the border dealing with the people who are freezing, living in tents because Trump has kept them on the other side of the border uh, when they're waiting to get their hearing dates set. So we have to be very careful not to expect other movements to kind of step up to something in ways that we're not really able to step up to. Um, and we have a lot of education work to do. We have a lot of, of mobilization. We need to think of, of more creative ways of doing mobilizations that don't require people to be in the streets these days. The, the pandemic is way not over. Uh, we don't wanna be putting people's lives at risk. So I think we have a whole lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. Well, I think that's really an appropriate place to end. Thank you very much, Phyllis. We're very grateful. Thank you all. For everything you said, and especially all the questions you raised and some of which you also answered. <laughs>
we continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S-U-N-D-A-Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F-A-L-L-E-N-B-A-U-M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609, or di directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org.